Chapter 25, it's about the digestive or gastrointestinal system. So when we ingest food, most of the food that we ingest cannot be assimilated as it is. So it has to be broken down into smaller components that our body can use. Then the digestive system acts as a disassembly line in which the nutrients go through different parts of the digestive system and with the aid of, of some enzymes or organs, we start breaking down into these smaller parts that will be ultimately absorbed by the circulatory system and then will be distributed throughout the body. Gastroenterology, it's a branch of medicine that helps to diagnose and treat disorders of the gastrointestinal system. Now the digestive system, it is in charge of processing food, extract the nutrients from those foods, and then to eliminate what we didn't use. We have five stages of digestion, ingestion, digestion, absorption, compaction, and defecation. In ingestion, we intake food, and then in digestion, we start doing this breaking down of this food that we ingested through uh, enzymes doing a chemical digestion or by uh, using our mouth or different other organs to start breaking down these nutrients in a mechanical way. And then absorption will be once we have these smaller parts or nutrients of the foods that we ingest, we will have specialized cells in the digestive tract that has microbili that helps to absorb these nutrients, including water, and then bring them into the uh, circulatory system. So uh, compaction will be absorbing more water from the already parts of the food that we ingest that uh, we might not use anymore, and we absorb so much water that we start dehydrating these components and make it more solid, and then you will form uh, feces, and the feces will be eliminated through defecation. So what is mechanical digestion? It's the physical breakdown of food into smaller particles. So it will involve uh, cutting and grinding and mixing with our teeth it will also involve uh, churning of these foods in the stomach and in the small intestines, and then expose this uh, food surface to the digestive enzymes. Chemical digestion, it will be using enzymes to start hydrolyzing different components or micromolecules like proteins, fats, carbohydrates into their monomers. In the case of uh, carbohydrates will be disaccharides, monosaccharides. In the case of proteins can be polypeptides, can be peptides, and in the case of fats will be triglycerides and uh, uh, well will be uh, glycerol molecule and uh, fatty acids for the triglycerides. And then we have several places within the digestive uh, system that uh, produces enzymes starting the mouth. We have the salivary glands that uh, secretes amylase and lipase that helps to start breaking down carbohydrates like starch and lipids. Then in the stomach, we have uh, many, many uh, molecules that help us to break down this these uh, foods like uh, pepsinogen. Uh, pepsinogen, it's produced by the chief cells in the stomach. This, it's a proenzyme. It's not an activated enzyme, so it has to be activated by combination with hydrochloric acid. And then when hydrochloric acid combines with pepsinogen, you form an enzyme that it is active that is called pepsin. And in this case, you will start breaking down uh, proteins into polypeptides. And then uh, within the pancreas, uh, we produce several enzymes, lipases, uh, we produce proteases, 
uh, like trypsinogen, trypsin, and we produce also amylase, uh, which uh, similarly as to the amylase that we have uh, in the mouth, it starts breaking down starches into uh, saccharides. And then these lipases will start uh, breaking down these uh, lipids into uh, fatty acids and then uh, we can absorb then all these nutrients into our circulatory system and also uh, some nutrients are presented in an unusable form in ingested food and cannot be directly absorbed example uh, will be the uh, fiber that many foods have and also uh, part of the ingestion of molecules that we have are vitamins amino acids uh, minerals cholesterol and uh, water okay so uh, there's a major subdivision of the digestive system according to uh, what uh, it is connected to it like the accessory glands which are teeth, tongue, salivary glands, liver, gut, bladder, and pancreas. And then we have the alimentary canal or digestive tract, which is basically a long tube uh, that measures 30 feet that extends from the mouth into the anus. And it's subdivided into different portions, uh, the oral cavity or mouth, and then following the pharynx, which is a shared tube between the digestive system and the respiratory system, if you recall. And then, uh, you have the esophagus that connects the pharynx to the stomach so we can transfer food from the oral cavity into the uh, esophagus and then into the stomach. And then we have the small intestine which is subdivided into three major regions and then we have the large intestine with, which, uh, with these different uh, portions. So, uh, <clears throat> Gastrointestinal tract, when we refer to gastrointestinal tract, we will be talking about the stomach and the intestines. And in here, uh, we have this uh, section, uh, coronal section, so you can see of the body, so you can see the different parts of the uh, digestive system. So here we have the oral cavity, we have the tongue within the oral cavity, we have the heart palate, soft palate, and then we have the salivary glands, uh, that drains saliva into the uh, oral cavity. And then we have this little funnel-like structure, the pharynx, that connects uh, the oral cavity into this uh, tube, muscular tube that we call the esophagus. And then the esophagus, it is located within the thoracic cavity. And then it will pierce the diaphragm, and then it will connect into the stomach. So the food will pass from the oral cavity into pharynx, into esophagus, and then into the stomach. And then the stomach will drain the food that it has churned into the first portion of the small intestines, which is the duodenum. And then from the duodenum, the food will pass into the second portion of the small intestines, which is the jejunum, and then it goes into the ileum. And then from the ileum, the food uh, that was used by our, our body that is basically most, mostly run out of nutrients, it will pass into the large intestines. And then uh, within the large intestines, we majorly absorb water and it start compacting the unusable food and then we will uh, produce feces and then it will, we will defecate the feces. Now there is a valve between the uh, small intestines and the large intestines that we call the ileocecal valve. That prevents feces from going into the small intestines. The majority of the small intestines, most of the times, we shouldn't have any uh, bacteria or any microorganisms within the small intestines because if we do have, we will have inflammation uh, into what we call enteritis and then we will have diarrhea. So in order to prevent then feces from going from the large intestine into the small intestines, we have the ileocecal valve. And then the first part of the uh, large intestine is what we call the sigmoid colon because it's like an italic S-shape uh, 
portion of these uh, intestines. And then we have uh, the Never mind, I was wrong. So <laughs> I got too excited. So uh, correction. So the did you know it is in here? Is the lar uh, last portion of the small intestine, and then we have the ileocecal valve in here, on the right side. Okay. So I was referring to this part, but no, it's here on the right side. And then we have the first portion of the large intestine, which is the cecum. Still, that valve, the ileocecal valve, uh, prevents the backing up of feces from the large intestines into the small intestines. Okay, and then uh, just next to the cecum, we have the appendix. Okay, and then we have this portion of the large intestine that goes up that is called ascending colon and then the ascending colon will do a turn to the left into what we call the hepatic flexure this region in here and then this part that goes from right to left that almost runs horizontally is called the transverse colon and then the transverse colon will make a turn downward turn and into uh, a flexure or um, a bend that we call the splen splenic flexure. Why we call it splenic flexure? Because we have here the spleen. And in this side, on the right side, we have the hepatic flexure because we have the liver, the hepatic gland. And then the, uh, after the uh, splenic flexure, the large intestine will go down into what we call the sending colon. And then now, we will have this S-like turn of the intestines that is called the sigmoid. And then the sigmoid will end up in the rectum and then into the anal canal and the anus. Uh, so before we move into the uh, next slide, so we have then accessory glands that connects to the gastrointestinal uh, track, which is, remember, the stomach and the intestines. So we have this uh, gallbladder, we have the pancreas that uh, drains their secretions into the gastrointestinal tract. And then we have a series of sphincters or circular layers of smooth muscle that controls the passage of food from uh, different areas of the, of the body or contents of the uh, gastrointestinal tract. So we have the upper esophagic sphincter around this area and we have the lower esophagic sphincter that prevents the, the food backing up from the stomach into the esophagus and then we have at the end of the stomach the pylorus which uh, prevents the uh, early emptying of the contents of the stomach into the uh, duodenum and then in here at the junction of the ileum, the large por last portion of the small intestine, with the first portion of the large intestine, we have the ileocecal valve that acts as an sphincter. And in here in the anus, we have an internal and external anal sphincters. The external is voluntary, the internal is involuntary. So the internal is made out of smooth muscle and the external is made out of skeletal muscle. And those sphincters, again, helps to control the passage of contents from one area of the gastrointestinal tract into the other. Okay, so digestive tract is in contact with the environment at both ends, at the oral cavity and at the anus. And then, uh, since most of the material in it has not entered the body, it can be considered uh, to be external to the body, the gastrointestinal system until you absorb these nutrients by the epithelial cells of the alimentary canal. So, as your book mentions, on a strict sense, defecated food residue was never in the body. Okay, so uh, gastrointestinal tract is made out of a muscular tube that runs from, again, oral cavity to the anus 
And these walls of the muscular tube has several layers. So the first layer, the most internal layer, is called the mucosa. It's made of epithelial cells of different types depending on what uh, portion of the uh, gastrointestinal tract you're, you're talking about. And then these epithelial cells are attached into the lamina propria. And then underneath, you have a layer that we call muscularis mucosae. So that's the mucosa, that's the first layer, made out of three parts. And then we have the submucosa, underneath the mucosa, and then in there we will have majorly uh, glands that produces either enzymes or they produce mucus. In, in most of the gastrointestinal tract, in general, the lumen, or the internal part where the food trans uh, get transferred, it has to be moisturized. And this uh, moisturization of the food comes from the submucosa because we have the glands there that secretes the mucus into the lumen. And then underneath the submucosa, we have the muscularis externa that has, with the exception of the stomach, it has two layers. It has the inner circular layer and the outer longitudinal layer. And as their name implies, the inner layer, the, run, the, the fibers run circularly or around. And then in the outer layer, the fibers run parallel to the, or longitudinal to the gastrointestinal tract. And then the last layer, the most external layer is called the uh, serosa in which you have uh, connective tissue, areolar connective tissue, and then you have uh, a membrane that is mesothelium and is made out of uh, peritoneum in the case of the serosa of the abdominal cavity. It's different in the esophagus, okay? So here are the uh, micro, here is the microscopic view of the elementary canal wall, uh, the different uh, layers. So we have uh, here the lumen. This is the lumen on the top. And then here we have the uh, mucosa with the epithelial cells in this part. Then we have the lamina propria in here attaching these uh, epithelial cells. And then uh, we have here submucosa with the lumen of the different glands that will secrete their mucus into the mucosa, mucosal layer. And then <clears throat> we have uh, here the muscularis layer, muscularis externa, with the circular layer here, and then the longitudinal layer in here. And then in here we have the serosa. So uh, for the mucosa, it's a mucous membrane, and uh, depending, uh, it has uh, these epithelial cells, and then depending on uh, which part of the gastrointestinal tract you're talking about is going to be the type of epithelium. So for instance, uh, it's simple columnar in most of the digestive tract with the exception of the oral cavity, the mouth, and the esophagus, which has a stratified squamous epithelium. And then also we have it in the lower air, uh, area of the digestive tract, which is the anal canal. So there is a reason for this. So in most of the digestive tract, we secrete or absorb uh, nutrients. Okay, and we secrete mucus or enzymes. So we have these specialized cells for doing this. So these are the simple columnar epithelium. And then in the mouth and in the esophagus, we are passing food that it is uh, not completely digested, so it can be uh, solid or semi-solid, and that produces friction against the walls of the mouth and the esophagus. So we have to have a stronger type of epithelium that it is specialized for uh, preventing damage through friction. 
So we have a stratified squamous epithelium similar as to the epithelium that we have in the skin. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that uh, we have the same, no, but it is a stratified squamous epithelium. So we have several layers of flat cells. And then in the lower anal canal, we have, again, this type of epithelium because it is specialized for friction. As we are defecating, many of these uh, feces that we are defecating will not be completely... Uh, soft so we have to have this protective epithelium and then the lamina propria is made out of a loose connective tissue layer muscular is mucosa it's a thin layer of smooth muscle and then uh, we have uh, in here this uh, smooth muscle because when this smooth muscle tenses uh, or contracts it will tense the mucosa making groups and ridges that increases the surface area and then you can absorb more okay and then uh, within the walls also of the uh, mucosa or the layer we have uh, sometimes lymphatic tissue that we call malt or mucosa associated lymphatic tissue So uh, for the submucosa, we have uh, many blood vessels. It is uh, also specialized for absorbing uh, nutrients or providing blood supply to the uh, mucosa. So we have many blood vessels there. We have lymphatics. We have a nerve plexus that it is uh, specialized for uh, innervating these glands so these glands will secrete mucus. And then sometimes the mucus associated lymphoid tissue will extend into the submucosa in some parts of the gastrointestinal tract. For instance, in the ileum, the Peyer's patches. Muscularis externa. So it has again these two layers, inner circular layer and outer circular layer these mus muscle layers are made out of smooth muscle and then uh, in some parts this smooth muscle in the inner circular layer will form a thick uh, valve that we call a sphincter that regulates the passage of material throughout the tract and uh, in between the inner and the outer circular layer uh, sorry in the in in between the inner and outer uh, layers we have a, a plexus as well of nerves that we call the myenteric plexus. This myenteric plexus will be responsible for the motility of these two layers so we can move the foot from proximal areas of the gastrointestinal tract into distal areas. Serosa, it's made again of connective tissue, areolar tissue, and then uh, it is topped by this simple squamous epithelium that we call the mesothelium. And uh, in the esophagus, this serosa begins uh, next to the connection to the stomach. So one inch, one inch and a half before the esophagus connects to the stomach. And then it ends before the rectum, this uh, covering or serosa. Now, the uh, serosa will be called adventitia in different areas of the gastrointestinal tract, but it's basically a serosa, but we call it differently. So uh, the adventitia, it's kind of uh, a little bit more thicker than the serosa, and it will help to connect the superior area of the esophagus that it is not closed by the stomach and then uh, it also blends to the pharynx and uh, also will be located the adventitia within the rectum into uh, the portion that runs next to other organs. So uh, here is a cross section of the uh, different layers of the digestive tract so you can see them in here this is the 
mucosa with the epithelium in most of the gastrointestinal tract will be simple columnar and it will have different variations according as well this simple columnar of what organ you're talking about and then we have here the submucosa with its different uh, glands and the blood vessels and we have the submucosal plexus that whenever you have innervation of this submucosa you have more secretion and more blood supply to the uh, to the lumen the, the secretion of the mucus and more blood supply to the regions next to the epithelium so that the epithelial cells will be healthier at some point. And then we have this muscularis layer that in most of the gastrointestinal tract we have to layer the inner circular and the outer longitudinal with the myenteric plexus that you can see here in yellow. And then we have the serosa or adventitia just in the outside of the muscularis externa. And uh, the muscularis externa in the stomach, it has three layers. It has the inner circular, uh, like this. It has the longitudinal, like this, but also has a third layer that we call the uh, oblique layer that helps us to make this churning motion. Okay, so uh, the gastrointestinal tract, it has uh, innervation by sympathetic system and parasympathetic system. Sympathetic system reduces the motility of the gastrointestinal tract, and it is given by the celiac ganglia, superior mesenteric, and inferior mesenteric ganglia. Parasympathetic system innervates as well the gastrointestinal tract with the vagus nerve from uh, the oral cavity, parts of the oral cavity, into the proximal large intestine. Distal large intestine it is innervated by the sacral nerves of the parasympathetic system. Now, uh, the gastrointestinal tract has a third innervation, which is given by the third branch of the autonomic nervous system, which is the enteric nervous system. If you remember, parasympathetic and sympathetic systems are part of the ANS, and then enteric nervous system is also part of the ANS, is the third division. And then uh, this division is very important. It has over 100 million neurons that can help the uh, intestines to have innervation independently of uh, feedback from the CNS. But the CNS still will influence on the action of, the, of this uh, enteric nervous system. So, uh, Again, uh, part of this ENS, we have uh, some mucosal plexus and myenteric plexus. So uh, some mucosal plexus is located in some mucosa and it controls the secretions of the uh, glands that are found within the mucosa. So when you activate this some mucosal plexus, you have more secretion and also can control the movements of the muscularis mucosae so you can make more uh, surface area for absorption. My enteric plexus uh, is made by parasympathetic ganglia and nerve fibers in between the inner and the outer circular layers and it controls uh, major movements of the gastrointestinal tract that we call peristalsis in which you have contraction and relaxation of the circular layer and longitudinal layer so you can propel the foot from proximal uh, gastrointestinal tract to distal gastrointestinal tract. Blood supply, uh, it comes together with this uh, membrane that is called the mesenteries. The mesenteries are 
two layers that are part of the parietal uh, peritoneum that helps to maintain the organs of the gastrointestinal tract attached indirectly into the abdominal wall. So, uh, it will prevent as well from the intestines to become entangled. Uh, at some point, it, it's not perfectly uh, doing that because in some cases you can have twisting of parts, parts of the intestines, but uh, it prevents most, most of the times from doing that. And then, uh, as I said, the blood supply will come through these mesenteries along with nerves that are going to provide innervation to the different uh, parts of the digestive tract. And then within these mesenteries, we have uh, part of the lymphatic tissue that prevents us from uh, having infections. And uh, we have the lymph nodes and the lymphatic vessels. Now, the specific blood supply will come from the abdominal aorta through the celiac trunk which is going to provide blood supply to part of the duodenum, the stomach, the liver, the spleen, and the pancreas, and then the superior mesenteric artery, which is going to provide blood supply to the entire small intestines and the first half of the uh, large intestine, and then the second half or the distal half of the large intestine is going to be provided uh, with blood supply through the inferior mesenteric artery. Again, the three are branches of the abdominal aorta, celiac trunk, SMA, and IMA. Okay, so this is a lateral or, yeah, a longitudinal view of the peritoneum. So this is the uh, parietal peritoneum, the one that covers the abdominal cavity that it is next to the abdominal wall. Okay, and then this parietal peritoneum will reflect over some organs, like in this case over the uh, liver, and it forms what we call the visceral peritoneum. Now, the visceral peritoneum that connects the liver and the stomach, this is the stomach, is called the lesser mentum. And then hanging from the greater curvature of the stomach, we'll see what is that uh, in a few slides, it is what we call the greater omentum that you can see here. The greater omentum is like an apron that uh, hangs of connective tissue that hangs from the stomach and protect us from the uh, damage that it can be created as the uh, loops of intestine will be doing as they're moving. If we didn't have this protection, which is a membrane, uh, whenever our intestines will be moving, we will have direct contact of these intestines to the internal abdominal wall, and this friction will damage the muscles of the intestines and then we will have uh, bleeding and perforation of our intestines. So uh, then here is the lesser momentum again connecting liver to stomach, uh, greater momentum hanging from the stomach. It is filled with fat, uh, this, this lesser momentum, but it is a cushion, okay? And then the mesentery holds the different loops of the small intestine to the posterior wall. Now, uh, this is the mesentery of the small intestine. The uh, actual mesentery also connects to the uh, large intestine, but in this case, instead of calling it mesentery, you will call it uh, mesocolon. Okay, I already talked about this, so let's move on. Uh, again, I already talked about that. Uh, Okay, so uh, for the peritoneum, we, we have then this parietal peritoneum that at some point uh, provides a barrier from certain organs than others. So whenever we have organs enclosed completely by the mesentery on both sides, we would call them 
intraperitoneal organs. Most of the organs in our, in our abdominal cavity are intraperitoneal. So there you can see the examples. Now, behind this membrane, okay, uh, we have organs that are not covered by this peritoneum. These organs will be called retroperitoneal organs. And uh, at some point, these organs are very important, so you prevent them from having contact with the, uh, the rest of the organs within the abdominal cavity. Examples of these will be kidneys, the uh, adrenal gland, and also uh, one part of the duodenum, pancreas, and uh, also some parts of the large intestine. Okay, so here you can see a better view of the lesser omentum connecting the liver to the stomach. So it connects the uh, inferior portion of the liver to the uh, lesser curvature of the stomach, which is here. And then in here we have the greater curvature of the stomach with the attachment of the greater omentum. And the greater omentum not only prevents friction for uh, the small intestines or even the large intestines, but also since he has this fat in it, it uh, basically provides certain warmth into or, uh, or increases the temperature within this area so that our intestines will be moving a little bit more at a warmer temperature. If we didn't have it, uh, at some point our intestines will move very slowly, digestion will take so much and the foods won't pass as fast as they're supposed to and we can have the risk of an infection. Reflection. If you reflect the greater momentum up, so if you retract it, you will see here the mesocolon attaching the different regions of the large intestine into the posterior abdominal wall and in here we have the mesentery attaching the different portions of the uh, small intestine into the uh, posterior wall. So uh, several things can regulate the motility and the secretion of the digestive tract, uh, like our innervation by sympathetic system, parasympathetic system, ENS, enteric nervous system, and hormones and paracrine paracrine mechanisms. So many of these hormones uh, are produced that regulates the motility and secretion of the stomach, or sorry, the gastrointestinal tract, are secreted within the different regions of the gastrointestinal tract, and then they will uh, regulate either locally or uh, regionally the, uh, the gastrointestinal tract. So we have uh, in neural control a short myenteric reflex that it produces a stretch or chemical stimulation. And then this will stimulate peristaltic contraction of swallowing. Now we will have a long reflex or bago bago reflex in which when you stimulate the parasympathetic system, you will increase motility and secretion of uh, the glands within the gastrointestinal tract. So hormones, we all know that, uh, know that they are uh, chemical messengers that can stimulate uh, distant parts of the digestive tract. In this case, we have uh, gastrin and secretin as an example, but we have many, many hormones uh, within the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, so for paracrine secretions will be chemical messengers, uh, that diffuse through the fluid to stimulate uh, nearby uh, target cells, which uh, act like hormones, okay? Okay, now let's talk about uh, specific uh, features of each of the regions of the uh, gastrointestinal tract. So the mouth is also known as oral buccal cavity functions is to ingest and start doing chemical and mechanical digestion of food. So when we masticate or when we chewing, 
we are uh, basically starting to do a mechanical digestion. And then as we are doing that, uh, we have these uh, glands within, uh, salivary glands within the oral cavity that secretes chemicals, enzymes, that helps to produce this uh, chemical digestion. So boundaries of the uh, oral cavity, the cheeks laterally, lips anteriorly, palate superiorly, and tongue inferiorly. The opening between the lips is known as oral fissure, and posteriorly in the oral cavity we have this opening that we call the fossas. The oral cavity has a stratified squamous epithelium again, and uh, I told you that it's similar to the skin, but uh, remember that the skin has uh, keratinized stratified uh, squamous epithelium. Well, not all the areas of the mouth has keratin. Only certain areas, the ones that are subject to abrasion, like the gums and the heart palate. The rest of the mouth, the majority of the mouth, it has non-keratinized uh, stratified squamous epithelium. Example, floor of the mouth, soft palate, uh, the epithelium that is located, or the mucosa located inside the cheeks, and then the lips. This is the anterior view of the oral cavity. So you can see <clears throat> the different structures. So the space between the lips and the gums is called the vestibule. And then the lips are held into their place by a frenulums. So we have here the superior frenulum and the inferior frenulum. And then uh, we have the uh, teeth within these uh, arches. So we have the superior arch and the inferior arch. And then in here we have the hard palate anteriorly and the soft palate posteriorly. And uh, in here again, hard palate, it, it has stratified keratinized epithelium while the uh, soft palate, it doesn't have keratin in it. And then hanging from the middle of the soft palate, we have this tissue that is called the uvula. And then this opening that you can see here are the fossas. And then on the sides, uh, next to the fossas, we have palatine tonsils. In the floor of our oral cavity, we have this muscular organ that it is a tongue. And then the tongue is held by the lingual frenulum. And then on the sides of the lingual frenulum, we have the openings for the submandibular gland and the sublingual glands. And uh, what else in here? I don't think, uh, I think we covered all. Uh, so let's move uh, into the tongue. So the tongue, uh, it has a ventral and a dorsal surface. So within, the ventral surface, we have uh, only this mucosa underneath that you cannot see here. Uh, it, it is uh, very thin, but in the ventral surface, sorry, in the dorsal surface, which is this, we have uh, two major regions. We have the body, and then we have the root. Now, the body, it is covered by this connective tissue and this epithelium that it has in their surface these gustatory cells inside the taste buds. And the body can be having many, many of these gustatory cells, but it will also has some cells that are not part of the gustatory system. So it has these uh, other cells that we call the papillae, the uh, filiform papillae, that are not labeled in here, that they don't have a specialized function other than telling our brain what texture of food you have. It is important, yes, of course it is important, but um, 
that's their function. So uh, we have other types of papillae, not only filiform, the filiform will be the ones that makes the most of this uh, epithelium on, on the dorsum of the, of the tongue. And uh, we have the fungiform papillae that you can see here. And these ones, they have gustatory cells attached to them. And then we have another papillae here on the sides of the tongue next to the root that we call the foliate papillae. They don't have any specific function. They are rudimentary. And then we have in between this region that we call the um, terminal sulcus, we have this uh, fungiform, sorry, uh, this circumvallate papillae or ballet papillae. So we have between 12 to 16 in here. And uh, the tongue is innervated by different cranial nerves. So this is an inverted V shape that it is formed part of the uh, sulcus terminale. And then it will divide the tongue into an anterior region, which is innervated by cranial nerve number seven and into a posterior region that it is innervated by cranial nerve number nine. This is a special sensory innervation. It helps us to detect different tastes. Okay, so uh, usually it is said, but uh, many people are finding that this is not completely to be true. They have made uh, some regional uh, distinction over what in what areas of your tongue you can detect the different types of taste. Uh, so they say, for instance, that next to these terminal sulcus, you can taste bitter substances, and then uh, that you can uh, taste uh, salty within the tip of the tongue and, and sweet within the lateral portion of the tongue. Well, they're, they're just not recognizing this anymore because it seems like uh, it is uh, not appropriate. They find uh, overlapping uh, of these different regions. But cranial nerve number seven will detect all the sensory information when it comes to taste uh, from this region, while the cranial nerve number nine or glossopharyngeal will detect the flavoring molecules coming into the posterior third of the tongue. And then cranial nerve number five, which is trigeminal, will have general uh, sensory innervation provided into the entire tongue. So if you bite your tongue and you feel pain, cranial nerve number five will detect that. If a food is hot in temperature, okay, uh, or if it's cold, cra cold, cranial nerve number five will detect that, okay? And then uh, in the posterior third of the tongue, we have this uh, lymphatic tissue, which is the uh, lingual tonsils. And then uh, movement of the tongue is given by cranial nerve number 12 or hypoglossal nerve. And in here we have the intrinsic muscles of the tongue and the extrinsic muscles of the tongue that helps in the movement of the tongue. Okay, for teeth, uh, if you're an adult, you have 32 teeth. 16 distributed within the mandible and 16 within the maxilla. So uh, if you divide this in quadrants, you have uh, on each quadrant two incisors, one canine, two premolars, and three molars. Kids, they don't have premolars. Functions of them, so basically incisors will be to cut, uh, canines to uh, grasp, or uh, puncture and shred food. Premolars will help similarly as two molars to crush the food, shred the food, and grind the food. Teeth are hold into uh, a space within the mandible or the maxilla that are called the alveolus. And then uh, the teeth are hold by periodontal ligament, which is collagen fibers 
uh, it helps to bind the root of the tooth into the alveolus and this connection of the tooth into the alveolus is called a gonfosis and uh, protecting the teeth we have in the alveolar bone we have the gingiva or gum now the tooth has different regions it has uh, a region that is covered by enamel that is called the crown and we have two types of crown we have clinical crown which is anything that you can see above the gingiva and we have uh, an anatomical crown which is everything that is covered by enamel now the deep portion of the tooth that it is uh, embedded within the alveolus is called the root and the root is covered by cementum and then the area where the crown and the root connects is called the neck and uh, we have uh, this gingival sulcus that it is a space uh, between the gum and the tooth and uh, this is where uh, bacteria can enter and then start uh, causing infections now uh, three layers of our uh, tooth will be enamel the outer layer that it is the actually hardest uh, uh, tissue in our body or uh, substance not, not tissue it's a substance so so enamel will be the hardest uh, substance in our body it is made out of uh, calcium salts and then we have deep to the enamel, we have the dentin, which is the second hard, hardest uh, tissue. Uh, sorry, uh, hardest. Yeah, that one, yes, is a tissue. We have the second hardest tissue in our body, which is the, the dentin, and it has a yellowish color. And then uh, <clears throat> in, inside the dentin, we have the pulp in the crown. Okay, and then uh, the cementum will be the outer layer that covers the root, and then we have the dentin uh, inside the cementum, and then we have the root canal within the root, which is the space where uh, blood vessels and nerves and lymphatics goes into the pulp, and then they enter into a specific area that is called the apical foramen that is located at the tip of the root canal. For children uh, or uh, infants, they will have uh, 20 deciduous teeth, or also known as milk or baby teeth. And then uh, they have uh, different periods of eruption that ranges between six to 30 months. Everything starts with the uh, maxillary incisors. And then uh, these will start gradually being replaced by the permanent dentition or teeth and this happens between uh, between ages 6 and 25 uh, uh, years old and uh, we have uh, in, in permanent dentition third molars that are no, known as wisdom tooth that can erupt between ages 17 to 25 years but uh, in many cases they don't erupt uh, they, they are there they are impacted but they don't erupt and this can be genetics uh, it's not necessarily something bad so uh, this is the diagram to show you the different types of dentition see here we have uh, the children teeth so <clears throat> they are 20 so they have central incisors lateral incisors canines first and second molars again children they don't have uh, premolars and in here you see the age of eruption of each of them for adults uh, also we have the age of eruptions and then uh, we have the same type of teeth as, as children but we have uh, first molar sorry first premolar second premolar in between canines and the first molar and we have some of you uh, some of us we don't uh, the wisdom tooth or third molar. So this is the uh, longitudinal section just to show you the different uh, layers of the tooth and the structure so uh, crown covered by enamel, root covered by cementum 
and then underneath we have dentin and then the pulp and the root canal and the apical foramen in here everything embedded within the alveolus there is a third classification of dentition that is called mixed in here uh, we have uh, the uh, sub, uh, replacement of some of these baby teeth with adult teeth and this is called mixed Oops. okay accessory structures within the oral cavity uh, salivary glands we have intrinsic and extrinsic. Intrinsic are everywhere. Uh, they are in the palate, within the lips, within the mucosa, in the cheeks. And they're constantly pr producing uh, small amounts of uh, saliva. But the uh, extrinsic salivary glands, uh, they produce the majority of the saliva. And they are three pairs. So we have the upper pair, which is the parotid glands. Uh, they are located between the skin and tear to the earlobes and uh, they have a duct that is called a stensis duct or the parotid duct that drains into the second superior molar. This gland can be inflammated by viruses, mumps virus, and then uh, we have uh, the second extrinsic glands, salivary glands, which are the submandibular glands. They are located uh, within the inside uh, of the body of the mandible, just next to the mandibular angle. Uh, these glands uh, are the second largest gland. The, the largest gland will be the parotid glands, and they are the actually the most active glands. So these ones produces more saliva than the rest. Okay, and then uh, they empty their uh, secretion. So they have a duct, the submandibular gland duct that drains into the side of the lingual frenulum just by the central uh, incisors and then we have the sublingual glands which are located under the tongue that's why they're called sublingual and they have many ducts that empties as well uh, next to the lingual frenulum into the papilla of the uh, sublingual or sorry submandibular duct the amount of saliva usually uh, produced per, per day ranges between 1 to 1.5 liters. And then the cells within the salivary glands that produces the saliva are called cells of the acini. They help to filter water and electrolytes from the blood. And then they can add, uh, in the case of certain uh, salivary glands, amylase, uh, mucin, and lysozyme. And then uh, lysozyme, it's an enzyme that helps to destroy microorganisms, preventing us from uh, getting infections. And also we produce also IgA, which is the antibody that protects us as well from infection. Uh, everything, it is under control of the salivary nuclei within the medulla oblongata and the pons. And then uh, these glands uh, get activated with uh, several stimuli like thinking about food, smelling food, tasting food, you can produce uh, more saliva. So here is the location of the salivary gland. So here and here to the earlobe, we have parotid gland. This is the largest, but not this is not the uh, most active. So in here, we have the submandibular, also known as submaxillary gland. This one, is the second largest but this is the one that produces most of the saliva and then in here we have the sublingual sublingual and uh, some mandibular gland they drain under the tongue just by the lingual frenulum this one is the parotid duct that drains into the second superior molar if you make a section of a salivary gland you'll be able to see that you see these uh, rounded structures that are called the acini. And in here you have cells that produces uh, thick secretions and others watery secretions. Although the serous cells will produce uh, watery secretion while the mucous cells will produce a thick secretion. 
And whenever you have both of these type of cells uh, you, together in one acne, you have what we call the mixed acnes. And then uh, you have different quality of saliva. Sometimes you have thick saliva, sometimes you have a thin or watery saliva. And this is the histology. So these salivary glands are made out of, uh, of cells. Uh, within the salivary glands are made out of uh, simple cuboidal epithelium. And then you have connective tissue around. And this is a duct where the saliva drains after it's produced by this acne. Okay, so uh, then the next region of the digestive tract is the pharynx. It's a muscular tube that connects the oral cavity to the esophagus and uh, the nasal cavity to the larynx. So again, it is shared by both digestive and respiratory tract. It has uh, a wall or a layer, sorry, uh, yes, a wall that is made by uh, muscular uh, tissue, skeletal muscles. So we have these three muscles, superior, inferior, and middle uh, constrictors that contracts and relax to push the foot from the oral cavity into the esophagus. So, uh, producing swallowing, okay? So when uh, not swallowing, the inferior constrictor, which is what we call the upper esophageal sphincter, will remain contracted. So you don't start uh, introducing air into your esophagus. And, uh, then we have these uh, phases of swallowing. So we have the oral phase in which uh, by the action of the tongue, you compress the bolus of food. When we start chewing our food and we grind it in our uh, oral cavity and we lubricate it with saliva, we call that a bolus. So when the bolus of the food uh, is compressed against the hard and the soft palate, you initiate the first phase of swallowing, which is called the oral phase. In the next phase, you will uh, compress more this bolus of food against the pharynx, sorry, the uh, soft palate, and that will bring the food down into the oral pharynx. This is called the pharyngeal phase. And while you're doing that, you will close the nasopharynx and you will elevate the larynx so you can bring the epiglottis over the larynx closing the airway and then you will have dilation of this muscle the uh, pharyngeal constrictors so that you receive the food and then you compress these pharyngeal constrictors to push the foot down into the esophagus, into what we call the esophageal phase. So when you receive the foot into the esophagus, you will start this series of contraction and relaxation of the wall of the esophagus. So you push the foot from proximal area of the esophagus into distal area, and then you open the lower esophageal sphincter, which is here, so you can pass the foot from the esophagus into the stomach. And that's uh, the stages of uh, swallowing or deglutition. Now the esophagus is a straight muscular tube that uh, measures uh, between 10 to 12 centimeters, uh, sorry, uh, inches or 25 to 30 centimeters in length. It begins at C6 and the cricoid cartilage and then it will extend from the pharynx to the cardial orifice of the stomach piercing uh, the uh, diaphragm and then uh, the esophagus will have this lower esophageal sphincter that will open when uh, you have a uh, foot coming into the stomach and then it will close. This opening and closure will allow the passing of the foot from the esophagus in the stomach and preventing the 
backing up of the food into the stomach, into what we call regurgitation. Now, if someone uh, doesn't close completely this esophagus, uh, the person is going to have backing up of the stomach acid into the esophagus, causing a heartburn that uh, will irritate the mucosa of the esophagus. Epithelium within the esophagus is a stratified squamous non-keratinized, and we have uh, glands that secretes mucus in the esophagus so that it can transfer food into the stomach with lubrication. Now, when it's empty, of course, it's uh, completely folded, the, the lumen, and then it opens and dilates during the passing of the food. Upper third of the esophagus is made out of the skeletal muscle, the layer of muscle, and then the lower th uh, two thirds will be made out of smooth muscle. So up to the first third, you still can control whether you will ingest the food or not, or transfer the food or not. Once the food reaches the second third, uh, the food will go automatically into the stomach. So you will meet the stomach at the level of T7 and it is covered by adventitia. So this is a, a cross section of the esophagus so you can see the different layers. So here is the uh, non-keratinized stratified epithelium and then we have the submucosa and then we have the muscularis in here and the adventitia in here in the outer part. There is a change of epithelium between the esophagus and the stomach. Uh, this is called gastroesophageal junction. So this part that you see here is a stratified squamous epithelium non-keratinized of the esophagus. And then you have a change into simple columnar in the stomach. This junction is kind of important because if someone has chronic gastroesophageal gastroesophageal re reflux, the person might convert this epithelium of the esophagus from a stratified squamous into simple columnar. And this is called Barrett's esophagus and the person can have uh, cancer due to this uh, change that we call metaplasia, by the way. Okay, now for the stomach. So uh, the stomach, it's a muscular sac that serves as a reservoir of food, temporary reservoir of food, and for uh, churning food. So uh, the volume when it's empty, it's 50 milliliters, very uh, little volume, and it can go up to four liters when the person is extremely fu full, but uh, the average of uh, volume when someone has a typical meal will be between 1 to 1.5 liters. So uh, the stomach has uh, different regions. So the region that it is closed by the um, esophagus is called the cardiac region. And then this dome-shaped region on the side of the cardiac region is called the fundus. And then this lower region that you see here is called the uh, pylorus. And in between the pylorus and the, uh, the uh, fundus, we have the majority of the, the uh, area of the stomach that we call the body. So all of this is the body. It has a J shape with a lesser curvature and a greater curvature that you can see here. And remember again, attaching into the uh, lesser curvature we have, lesser momentum, and attaching into the greater curvature we have, the greater momentum. Now, uh, so we have here the different uh, layers of the stomach. So here we will have uh, the adventitia all these, and then here we have the muscularis layer, the muscularis externa. Remember what I told you a few slides ago? The stomach has three layers instead of two of, advent of muscularis. So it has 
longitudinal layer, it has circular layer, and it has a third layer, which is oblique. It helps us to do this churning motion, like if you were wrinkling, uh, I don't know, like a towel to, to squeeze the water out of it. So this will help to do this churning motion, this mixing action, and then you convert the food that you receive from the, the esophagus into a liquid form or semi-solid form that we call chyme, C-H-Y-M-E, okay? Now, uh, then uh, beneath the uh, muscular layer, we have the submucosa and then we have the mucosa. And in here, in this mucosa layer, you will see when the stomach is empty, a series of foldings that we call the gastric rugae. Rugae, uh, it's like uh, wrinkles in Spanish, it's, it's arrugas. So these foldings, when it's empty, will disappear after someone eats, a f eats, eats or drinks something and then increases the surface area for absorption. Now, uh, within the pyloric part, we have this entrace or antrum, and then we have this narrowing portion that we call the canal, and then we have this sphincter that is called the uh, pylorus or pyloric sphincter. And then the stomach will empty the chyme into the first part of the small intestine that you can see here, that is called the duodenum. Okay, so this is a microscopic view of the uh, stomach. So within the stomach, the epithelium of the stomach, we have uh, what we call gastric pits and gastric glands. And uh, in here we have different types of cells that they have a different function. So for instance, we have the parietal cells, these ones in here that secretes hydrochloric acid and uh, a factor that we call intrinsic factor. This intrinsic factor, it's, uh, it's a substance that protects vitamin B12 from destruction from the acid of the stomach. So it's a protective then uh, substance that coats the vitamin B12 so the vitamin B12 won't be destroyed by the hydrochloric acid. And then we have here on top, sheaf cells. So the sheaf cells have also an important function which is producing this proenzyme, pepsinogen. So when pepsinogen, which is an inactive enzyme, produced by the chief cells combines with the hydrochloric acid that is produced by the uh, parietal cells, you will activate this pepsinogen into pepsin and then you can start breaking down proteins into polypeptides. So you start having in here uh, chemical digestion of proteins. And also within the stomach, we secrete an enzyme that we call lipase. So we start partially digesting fats in the stomach with this uh, gastric lipase. Now within the stomach we also have uh, G cells that uh, secretes uh, an enzyme that we call uh, gastrin or a substance that we call gastrin and uh, gastrin can increase the movement of uh, the stomach. And then we have mucus cells that secretes mucus, and we have delta cells that secrete somatostatin. So we have, uh, again, uh, many, many different cells within the stomach uh, that they have uh, different secretions and then they have different functions. So this is the uh, view of the gastric pits and the gastric glands in here. So this epithelium again is simple columnar and uh, we have mucous cells within the neck of these gastric pits and also a little bit below the uh, neck and then we have these parietal cells in here we have g cells that secrete gastrin that increases uh, motility of the stomach 
an emptying of the stomach. And then we have chief cells here uh, within this area, within the, the bottom of the uh, gastric glands, which, which are these ones. So a better view of these uh, gastric glands. So these gastric glands have uh, different type of cells or uh, different distribution in the number of cells as to the glands that we have within the pylorus. So the gastric glands, they have many chief cells as you can see here and they also have many of these parietal cells so you secrete a lot of pepsinogen and a lot of hydrochloric acid within these glands and you don't have so many mucous cells but in the pylorus you, you have a lot of mucous cells and very little g cells and very little parietal cells and chief cells so this pyloric gland secretes more mucus than anything else. Why? Well, because by gravity, if, if you go back into this uh, slide, by gravity, the gastric glands that are here that secrete this hydrochloric acid, by gravity, the hydrochloric acid will go into this region, into the pylorus. And if you don't have this mucus producing cells within the pylorus, the hydrochloric acid, which by the way starts also uh, digesting proteins, will start digesting these cells of the pylorus. So you have to have extra mucus within this region. And this region, guys, by the way, is the region where we can start having ulcers by the presence of uh, excess of irritation, not only by excessive production of hydrochloric acid, or chemical insults, but also by the presence of a bacteria that we call Helicobacter pylori. And this, this bacteria can also cre uh, produce cancer. Now, hydrochloric acid, it is produced uh, in uh, different steps, okay? So, uh, <clears throat> in this diagram, you have this parietal cell that with the aid of carbonic anhydrase enzyme will condense CO2 and water. So it will combine CO2 and water to form carbonic acid. And then carbonic acid is going to be dissociated into bicarbonate ions and into hydrogen ions. That's the second step. In the third step, bicarbonate and hydrogen ions are going to be extruded from the cell. And then uh, this, in the fourth step, hydrochloric acid is going to be combined outside of the cell with these chloride ions that are coming from these uh, capillaries that we have uh, next to this parietal cell. So by diffusion, chloride is going to go from the capillaries into parietal cells and then into the lumen of the stomach you have to form hydrochloric acid within the lumen of the stomach. You cannot produce it inside the parietal cells because hydrochloric acid will start destroying these cells. So then those are the four steps to make this hydrochloric acid. I already mentioned that. Function of hydrochloric acid to activate pep pepsin and uh, it says they're lingual lipase, but it's actually uh, uh, gastric lipase. Uh, another function of hydrochloric acid, of course, is to maintain a low pH within the stomach, which is usually between 1 and 3. And uh, this low pH will inhibit bacterial growth, just in case that you have ingested food that is contaminated with bacteria. And this uh, hydrochloric acid will also help in the absorption of iron. So it will convert iron three or ferric ion into iron two or ferrous iron. And ferrous iron will be absorbed and it will be used for hemoglobin synthesis. So when someone is taking antiacids, 
it will be neutralizing hydrochloric acid and the person won't be able to absorb iron because iron won't be produced from Fe3 plus form into Fe2 plus form. So what is pepsin? It's a proenzyme or a cymogen that uh, will help to digest proteins into polypeptides so the, these polypeptides will move into the small intestine and then they will be converted into amino acids so that they can be absorbed. So this is what I have explaining again and again. Hydrochloric acid with pepsinogen, you form pepsin and then you break down these proteins into polypeptides or partially digested protein. Gastric lipase, uh, they digest uh, dietary fats between 10 to 15 percent of our dietary fats. And then the rest, the 90 to 85 percent will be digested within the small intestines by primary uh, secretions of the pancreas. Intrinsic factor, it's a glycoprotein that uh, coats vitamin B12 so vitamin B12 will be protected from destruction and vitamin B12 will be absorbed specifically by the uh, cells of the ileum in the intestine, in the small intestine. And if someone has uh, uh, a disease that is uh, called pernicious anemia, the person will have uh, antibodies against these parietal cells and then the person won't be able to produce intrinsic factor. So uh, since vitamin B12 is necessary for production of red blood cells and you won't have intrinsic factor available, vitamin B12 will be destroyed and then you don't produce uh, enough red blood cells, you will have anemia, pernicious anemia. And then as well, if someone has um, surgery of the ileum, ileectomy, the person won't be able to absorb vitamin B12. Remedy for any of these cases is giving shots of vitamin B12 instead of taking orally. So the deficiency of vitamin B12 will cause pernicious anemia. Okay, so uh, regulation of the gastric function. So we have a cephalic phase in which the vagus nerve will stimulate uh, more secretion by the glands of the stomach even before food is swallowed. Uh, you start imagining your favorite food, you start smelling it, and then you start secre uh, um, uh, activating action potentials through the vagus nerve. So you start secreting more uh, secretions of the stomach like hydrochloric acid, uh, gastrin. So you will uh, be prepared just in case that you are lucky and that you can eat. Then in the gastric phase, uh, you start actually secreting gastrin, histamine, and then this will uh, start digesting this food and it will start activating what we call the short myenteric uh, reflex in which uh, after the food has stretched the stomach and activates this myenteric uh, plexus, you will uh, increase the motility of the stomach so you can mix this uh, content of the stomach with the different enzymes or uh, secretions of the stomach like hydrochloric acid. And then in the intestinal phase, you will uh, form what we call the enterogastric reflex that uh, is going to stimulate uh, the intestinal gastrin is going to stimulate the stomach but uh, secreting which is an enzyme that it is produced by the actual duodenum as the food is passing into the duodenum you secrete secreting in an enzyme that is called uh, sorry a hormone that is called CCK or cholecystokinin 
So you will decrease the uh, secretions of uh, histamine and gastrin because you are emptying the stomach. So if the food is passing into the duodenum, there is no more uh, purpose for you to start secreting enzymes or hydrochloric acid if you already have uh, mixed the food. And then you have then a negative effect on the secretion of, of uh, substances within the stomach. And then uh, you will stimulate the secretion of intestinal gastrin. And then you will produce this enterogastrin reflex or enterogastric reflex in which you send a signal into the brain to activate these uh, sympathetic nerve fibers to decrease the motility of the stomach, but to increase the motility of the intestines. So you can start now moving the intestines more while reducing the motility of the stomach. Okay, um, so once you have then the digestion of uh, proteins within the stomach and you have produced uh, polypeptides or oligopeptides, your uh, food that it is partially digested will buffer the stomach, uh, the uh, pH of the stomach, the hydrochloric acid. So your pH will be more alkaline, and then the elevated alkaline will make this uh, stimuli into these cells, the G cells, and the G cells will start secreting gastrin, and then you will activate this secretion of hydrochloric acid that is going to provide a circle in here, or a cycle, sorry, to keep digesting more proteins as they are available. Okay, now uh, let's talk about accessory glands like uh, the liver. So the liver is the largest gland in our body. It's, it's fairly heavy. Uh, weights like around six pounds. It's located in the right upper quadrant and it's subdivided into different lobes. We have the two major lobes that you can see in an anterior view which are right and left. The, the then the right it is uh, much bigger than the left and you have two minor lobes that you can only see through the inferior view which are the quadrate and caudate and then next to these uh, two ma minor lobes we have the hilum which is the portal uh, of entry for the uh, blood vessels like the hepatic uh, artery proper the hepatic portal vein and then uh, the exiting of the bile ducts and uh, the entry of these nerves that all travel through the lesser omentum. Now underneath the uh, right lobe we have the gallbladder which is a little pouch that stores bile. As the hepatocytes, the, the cells of the liver starts uh, metabolizing the nutrients they will uh, produce bile and also they start metabolizing uh, pigments. So we produce the bile and the bile will be temporarily stored within the pouch, the, the gallbladder. And then within the inferior uh, region, uh, we can see these then, the two minor lobes and the gallbladder, while in the superior surface you will be able to see an area that is called the bare area of the uh, liver where the diaphragm and the liver are in close contact. For the microscopic uh, anatomy of the liver, we have hepatic lobules, which are the functional and a structural unit of the liver. There are units that has a two millimeter length and one millimeter in diameter. In the center of these hepatic lobules, we have a central vein. And then we have rows of hepatocytes surrounding this uh, central vein. And the hepatocytes will be surrounded by 
sinusoids, which are uh, these capillaries that has big gaps in between that helps in the passage of uh, red blood cells and proteins into the circulation. Okay, so uh, the anatomy of the gallbladder. So it has a pear shape and it has a neck, it has a fundus, it has a body. And it measures around four, four inches in length or 10 centimeters. And inside you have this simple columnar epithelium. And the fundus or head projects slightly beyond the inferior margin of the liver, while the neck leads into a duct that connects the liver to the gallbladder that we call the cystic duct. In here, bile comes in and out as necessary for storage or for release. What is the bile? The bile is a yellowish green fluid that has minerals uh, like calcium, it has ions, it has cholesterol, it has uh, fats, neutral fats, phospholipids, and bile pigments and bile acids. So it's a very complex chemical. Now the pigments uh, for the bile comes from bilirubin which is uh, the, coming from the, uh, the composition of the heme group from hemoglobin. And then bacteria in the large intestine will help to metabolize this bilirubin into urobilinogen. So bile is secreted into the duodenum, into the second portion of the duodenum. Then from there it goes into the large intestine and then bacteria in the large intestine will start forming this pigment for the urine, which is called urobilinogen, and then, uh, or urobilin, that makes the urine to be yellow. And then we have uh, stercobilin, the conversion of this urobilinogen into stercobilin to make our, our feces to become brown in color. Bile salts are steroids that helps to emulsify fats. So whenever the fats from the stomach are emptied into the duodena, we keep digesting these fats, but we have to emulsify them first. So we have to combine them with water or make them into smaller uh, fat molecules. This is the action of the bile salts. So it acts like if it was a detergent. And then uh, the gallbladder is in constant motion, concentrating the bile as it's absorbing water, but sometimes the, the gallbladder doesn't move as much, and in, in, in the salts in the, in the bile can precipitate and form uh, gallstones, that it can create uh, problems later. Okay, so here is the, the liver, right lobe bigger than the left lobe. This is the anterior view, and you can see under the right lobe here, the, uh, gal, the gallbladder. These two lobes are separated by uh, this falciform ligament that are uh, located uh, within the round ligament. And then this is the inferior view. You can see here the inferior vena cava. Here we have the uh, hepatic uh, portal vein or portal vein. And then uh, we have the hepatic artery proper. Here we have the cystic duct. And then we have this cauded lobe and quadrate lobe. And, and of course, this is the, the gallbladder. These are the hepatic lobules. So here we have central vein and then we have these branches of the central vein going into the periphery of the uh, of the lobules. So the lobules have kind of a hexagonal shape, and then we have the rows of hepatocytes, and uh, these these will be the the sinusoids at some point. Okay, now <coughs> add the vertices or the angles of these hexagons, the lobules. We have the hepatic portal triad, which are made by a branch of the hepatic portal vein, a branch of the hepatic artery proper, 
a bile ductule. So three structures in here. So the bile as is produced by these hepatocytes will come into the bile canaliculi, which are these, and then it drains into this bile ductule. And then the bile ductules will merge and will form the right and left hepatic uh, bile ducts, and then these will merge and they will form the common bile duct. And these will drain together with uh, the main pancreatic duct into the second portion of the duodenum. So you can see a magnification of one of the regions of this hepatic lobule. So we have here hepatocytes and we have uh, here the sinusoids and then uh, the blood is filtered through here and then we have the hepatic macrophages which are called Kupfer cells. Then uh, these ones uh, will have a very important role in protecting from uh, toxins and then the blood will flow from this region into this region and then you produce proteins uh, like albumin and then you secrete into the circulation. This is the microscopic view of the lobules. So this is a lobule. So here we have the central vein and here we have a triad made by a branch of the hepatic artery proper, a bile ductule, and a branch of the hepatic portal vein. Now the uh, hepatic portal vein, it is uh, a vein that receives uh, this uh, nutrient-rich blood that drains the blood vessels from the small intestines with this nutrient-rich blood and then it goes into the liver so that the liver can metabolize these uh, nutrients. Again, hepatic portal vein, hepatocytes, and the sinusoids in here. Okay, now for the pancreas. So this pancreas is a retroperitoneal organ that it is found posterior to the cur greater curvature of the stomach. It is a short organ, but very important, between 12 to 15 centimeters in length and two and a half centimeters in thickness. It has different regions. It has a large region that encircles the duodenum, or well, the duodenum encircles it. It's called the head, and it has a mid portion, which is the bulkier part of the pancreas, which is the body, and it has a tiny portion that is called the tail. Uh, Pancreas is a mixed gland, so it has endocrine and exocrine uh, functions. The endocrine function is to secrete uh, insulin, glucagon, and somatostatin. Insulin drops the blood glucose while glucagon increases it, and somatostatin regulates the secretion of both insulin and glucagon. This uh, uh, endocrine uh, function or the hormones are secreted in the pancreatic islets, which makes 1% of the tissue of the uh, pancreas. 99% of the tissue of the pancreas is exocrine, so we have the uh, pancreatic acini that secretes pancreatic juices, which uh, are between 1.2 and 1.5 liters per day. And then within these pancreatic juices, we have uh, different uh, enzymes and bicarbonate and water. So pancreatic juices are made out of water, bicarbonate, and they are made uh, out of uh, pancreatic lipase, uh, proteases like trypsin, chemotrypsin, and also uh, pancreatic amylase. Now the exocrine portion, the one that we are going to consider the most since this is the digestive system, empties into the uh, pancreatic duct. So all the acini, they drain these enzymes into the pancreatic duct and these enzymes are not activated still. Otherwise you have out of digestion of the, of the pancreas. So you secrete proenzymes and these proenzymes are going to be activated by 
the pH, the right pH in the duodenum. Okay, so uh, pancreatic duct will join the bile duct at the hepatopancreatic ampulla, and we have uh, this sphincter at the end of this ampulla that is called the hepatopancreatic sphincter or sphincter of Odi that opens and closes in response to uh, the amount of food and the type of food that comes into the uh, duodenum. For instance, if you ingest a fatty meal, you will secrete uh, bile into the duodenum so you can emulsify the fats and also you will secrete uh, a pancreatic juice that is more rich in uh, pancreatic lipase. Okay, and then besides this main pancreatic duct, we have an accessory pancreatic duct that opens on one side of this hepatopancreatic uh, sphincter and it helps to bypass the sphincter and allows for pancreatic juice to be released into the denim even when bile is not. So when you don't need to emulsify anything, you can secrete uh, pancreatic ju juices using this secondary sphincter. So since these enzymes are not activated, still when they are released, they're called pancreatic cymogens. A cymogen is an inactive enzyme. And then we have then trypsinogen that it is converted into trypsin by an enzyme within the intestinal lumen that is called enteropeptidase. And then uh, trypsin will be autocatalytic, so it will convert more trypsinogen into more trypsin. Chemotrypsinogen, it will be converted first into trypsinogen and then into trypsin. And then we have uh, another set of proteases that we call procarboxypeptidase that will convert uh, into trypsin by an enzyme that is called carboxypeptidase. Uh, amylase is uh, an enzyme that digests carbohydrates like starch and lipase will digest fat. And then we have other enzymes, uh, nu uh, nucleases like uh, ribonuclease and deoxyribonuclease that digest RNA and DNA. Okay, so this is the anatomy of the pancreas and uh, the gallbladder. So gallbladder has a neck, a body, and a fundus, by the way. It's not labeled, but this is the fundus. And then we have the cystic duct that receives the bile from the uh, common hepatic duct. Common hepatic duct is formed by the left and right hepatic ducts. So once you form bile, it will go first into the gallbladder to be stored and then to be concentrated. And when it's necessary, the contraction of the gallbladder under the influence of cholecystokinin uh, or CCK will make this bile to empty into the bile duct. And then the bile duct will come here into the head of the pancreas and together with this main pancreatic duct will empty into the hepatopancreatic uh, ampulla or uh, and into the second portion of the duodenum. So this is the first, second, third, and fourth portion of the duodenum. Pancreas regions, bulk, head, large, large uh, body in here and the tiny tail in here. And then you have main pancreatic duct and then accessory pancreatic duct. MRI of the pancreas showing you the location behind peritoneum in here. If you magnify uh, pancreatic acini, you will see that this is made by these cells, the acinar cells, which has cymogen granules. So these are the uh, proenzymes that are made in here, the inactive enzymes, that will be secreted into this duct of the acini, and then they will drain into the main pancreatic duct. So this is the exocrine pancreas. Now the endocrine pancreas will, will be this. These are the islets of Langerhans, or pancreatic islets. Here you have alpha cells that secretes glucagon, beta cells that secretes insulin, and delta cells that secretes uh, somatostatin. 
1% of the pancreas is endocrine, 99% is exocrine. So these pancreatic islets that you see here in purple are surrounded by a large number of acini. So here is the activation of the pancreatic enzymes. Pancreatic enzymes are activated by the neutral pH of the intestine. Why is this neutral pH creating here? Well, remember the chyme that comes from the stomach, that it is located somewhere in here. It is acid. So as this acid is coming into the duodenum, this acid is neutralized by the bicarbonate of the pancreatic juices. So you uh, convert this chyme that it is acidic into uh, neutral uh, pH chyme. And then under these uh, conditions, trypsinogen will be become trypsin. Trypsin will help to activate chemotrypsinogen into chemotrypsin. And then it also helps these carboxypeptidase to become carboxypeptidase. And then uh, trypsinogen, of course, is converted by uh, enteropeptidase into uh, trypsin. Okay, so now for the key points before we move into the rest. So, uh, so the blood vessels that carry nutrient-rich blood into the liver will be hepatic portal vein. Hepatic portal vein will be this vein that brings this nutrient-rich uh, blood into the liver. This vein, it is uh, an important vein because it will have several anastomoses that will uh, create a uh, hypertension in some areas of the body if you have uh, problems in the liver like cirrhosis, for instance. Now, the chief cells in the stomach secretes pepsinogen. Cholecystokinin, the third uh, key point, will be a hormone that stimulates the release of bile from the gallbladder. Fourth key point, the liver is responsible for the production of albumin, production of bile, metabolic control, and hematologic control because it secretes also uh, clothing factors. Fifth key point will be that gastric, gastric inhibitory peptide or GIP stimulate the islet cells of the pancreas to release insulin. Sixth key point, kupfer cells or the hepatic macrophages destro will destroy red blood cells and bacteria, phagocytose and present antigens. Seventh key point is that secretin it's a hormone that it will stimulate the pancreas to produce a fluid that is rich in bicarbonate ions. Eight key point. Pancreatic juices will be containing enzymes that can digest carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids. Ninth key point. Trypsin. It's an enzyme that will digest proteins into peptides. And the last key point is the steps of forming hydrochloric acid. So starting with the step that it has an enzyme. So you will combine water and carbon dioxide with uh, carbonic anhydrase to form carbonic acid. And then the second step in here will be carbonic acid will dissociate into bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. And in the third step, hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions are transported out of the cell 
and in the fourth and last step of hydrochloric acid formation, chloride ions will combine with hydrogen ions to form hydrochloric acid in the lumen of the stomach. Okay, now for the small intestines, it's subdivided into duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. Duodenum measures 25 centimeters or 10 inches in length, begins at the pyloric valve or pylorus, and it will arch around the head of the pancreas and ends at the duodenal jejunal flexure. Now, in the second portion of the duodenum, we have the opening of the major, major and minor uh, duodenal papillae that allows the draining of pancreatic juices and the bile. Jejunum forms the first 40% of the small intestine beyond the duodenum, measures between 1 to 1.7 uh, meters in the living person and has uh, plicae circula circularis, which are large, tall uh, space circular folds. It has a thick muscular wall, and it has rich blood supply that gives this reddish color. Why? Because most of the nutrients are absorbed in here. The ileum forms the 60% of the intestines after the duodenum measures between 1 and uh, 1.6 and 2.7 meters and the walls are thinner and less muscular and less vascular thus they are paler in, in color than the jejunum and in here you have the Peyer's patches that protect us from infections ends at the ileocecal junction in the ileocecal belt that prevents the feces from the cecum to back up into the jejunum. Now, both jejunum and ileum are interperitoneal and they are covered by serosa. So here are the regions then of the uh, small intestine. Jejunum, C-shaped, then, sorry, duodenum, C-shaped, jejunum here in, uh, uh, purple or violet color, and then ileum in here, ending in the ileocecal valve that you see here. Most of the absorption of nutrients and water happens within jejunum. Ileum has Peyer's patches. The absorption then of these nutrients and water happens because the enterocytes or the intestinal cells has this bile, and within the bile we have microbili. And then inside this bile, we have the uh, lacteals that helps to absorb the, the fats, and then they bring it into the, uh, into the lymphatic uh, system, and then into the circulatory system. And then we have these capillaries in here, capillary networks, that helps to bring the nutrients from the lumen into the circulatory system. Now within the... Uh, Billy, we have this microbili that forms like a brush border, uh, and then we have brush border enzymes that helps to make the final digestion of the nutrients. Uh, we have as well within these cells uh, or within this um, billy, we have these globet cells that secretes this uh, mucus, and. The secretions of the intestines, in the secretions of the intestines, we have IgA that also help us to uh, prevent infections. So this is a huge magnification of the small intestine. So we have here the bile of the duodenum with a scanning electron micrograph. So uh, here we have uh, a section of the duodenum. This is a microscopic view of the duodenum. So here we have cribs, we have the uh, epithelial cells of the intestines, uh, of the duodenum, and here we have the duodenal glands, muscularis, and serosa. Jejunum, we have brush border enzymes that helps to convert these uh, 
peptides into amino acid, these uh, carbohydrates into monosaccharides, disaccharides, and you can absorb them. The ileum is here, uh, Peyer's patches, you can see it in here. Intestinal crypts, they secrete between one to two liters of intestinal juice per day. And then uh, your pH in here is between 7.4 and 7.8. So uh, again, uh, the, the stomach pH is between one and three. And see how in here we have a huge change in pH. So we have more alkaline type of uh, pH that helps in the activation of the enzymes of the pancreas and also in the absorption of nutrients. So what are the contents of the intestinal secretion? Water, mucus, and a little bit of enzyme. And then uh, the transfer of the uh, nutrients or the foods within the small intestine happens by contraction and relaxation of the muscular walls into what we call uh, peristalsis. And not only you help in the transfer, but also you segment the foot so you can uh, have contact of the foot with the plicae circularis so you can absorb more nutrients. So peristalsis from proximal to distal regions. Starches, uh, they start being digested in the mouth of course with the presence of salivary amylase but they, some of them they are not uh, completely digested, so they come into the duodenum, so the pancreas secretes this pancreatic amylase and start breaking these starches into maltose and oligosaccharides, like uh, the maltose, uh, dextrose, and glucose, and with the aid of these enzymes, maltase, dextrinase, and glucoamylase, you uh, you have uh, smaller monomers that you can absorb through the intestines. Uh, we have uh, different transporters. We have fructose transporters. We have glucose sodium transporters, galactose uh, sodium co-transporters that helps to bring all these uh, carbohydrates from the lumen of the intestines into the intestinal cells and later into the uh, bilus so they can be absorbed into the circulation. For proteins, uh, so we ingest them, we start breaking down in the stomach with the pep pepsin into polypeptides and also with the aid of the hydrochloric acid as well. So we don't have chemical digestion of proteins in the uh, mouth, we have them in the stomach. And then from there, uh, the peptides will go into the second portion of the denom, uh, the peptidases or proteases that we produce in the pancreas goes into the second portion of the denom. And then you start breaking down these uh, proteins into polypeptides and then into oligopeptides with the aid of trypsin and chemotrypsin and carboxypeptidases. And then uh, you suddenly start forming a smaller units, the amino acids, that they will be uh, absorbed into the circulatory system. So we have these carboxypeptidase, aminopeptidase, and dipeptidase that are located here within the microbili. Uh, these are brush border enzymes that helps to uh, break down these uh, polypeptides into these peptides, and sorry, into these amino acids or these dipeptidases into single amino acids so that they can be absorbed into the uh, circulatory system. Fats, uh, they have to go first under the process of emulsification because they, before they can be absorbed. So you have here a big, big fat globule that with the aid of uh, bile, uh, bile salts, you break them down into smaller droplets. This is called emulsification, and these, uh, they can be combined with uh, water, so they will be water-soluble, these small uh, globets. Uh, it's like when you can compare emulsification process when you are having uh, these plates after you eat that has oils in it, and then you add this soap, uh, dish, dish soap, 
and then you start seeing how these uh, oils start breaking down into smaller uh, droplets. Well, that's emulsification process. And then through this emulsification process, you make these small droplets and then lipase, uh, pancreatic lipase can start breaking down these fats, uh, triglycerides, into free fatty acids and monoglyceride. And then they can be absorbed by uh, the cells, the enterocytes, and then they can be reconstituted into what we call micelles. So here we have these micelles that will be coming into the enterocytes, and then you form chylomicrons, and then these chylomicrons will be absorbed by the lacteals. And then they will be brought into the circulatory system. So this is the summary of uh, nutrient digestion. So uh, you start having digestion of carbohydrates and lipids within the stomach with the aid of uh, lingual lipase and salivary amylase. And then from there you continue with the digestion of the fats and the carbohydrates as we said before. And then the proteins uh, will start being digested by the stomach uh, through this uh, gastric lipase. And then from there you continue with the digestion of the, of the proteins with these uh, enzymes coming from the pancreas, trypsin, chemotrypsin, uh, pancreatic lipase, and then uh, you absorb them with the aid of these uh, dipeptidase and aminopeptidases that we have in the brush border of the intestines. Okay, so uh, this is all for this chapter. Uh, as you can see, I uh, reorganized the PowerPoint presentation is not the same as the one that you have. I didn't want to take out that part because I, I know that uh, and, and do it at the beginning of the semester because I know that you need to, to have also the rest of the presentation. But uh, this is all for now. Uh, hopefully uh, you can see it completely. Have a nice day or uh, have a good night. And uh, I will uh, let you know when the next chapter will be available. Bye-bye.